Muy buenos días, amable auditorio. El día de hoy, 22 de noviembre de 2021, nos encontramos en el primer día del segundo coloquio de investigación en salud que organiza la Facultad de Medicina y Psicología de la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, Campus Tijuana. Soy la doctora Adriana Carolina Vargas Ojeda y tengo el privilegio de fungir como moderadora en esta sesión. Es un gusto y un gran honor para mí presentar a la doctora Stephanie Strathy, investigadora reconocida internacionalmente. A continuación, leeré una pero muy breve semblanza de nuestra distinguida y muy querida ponente. La doctora Stephanie Strathy es epidemióloga especialista en enfermedades infecciosas, nacida en Canadá y ha pasado la mayor parte de su carrera centrándose en la investigación de la prevención del VIH en poblaciones marginadas de países desarrollados y en desarrollo. Es decana asociada de Ciencias de la Salud Global, profesora Harold Simon de la Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad de California, San Diego, y codirectora del Centro de Aplicaciones y Terapias Innovadoras de Fagos, IPAD. Ha recibido más de 64 millones de dólares en subvenciones de investigación federales como investigadora principal. Es conocida por su trabajo en programas de investigación y prevención del VIH en Tijuana y participado generosamente con investigadores de nuestra facultad en numerosos proyectos binacionales. En 2016, a la doctora Strady y sus colegas se les atribuyó haber salvado la vida de su esposo de una infección mortal por superbacterias utilizando bacteriófagos, virus que atacan a las bacterias. El caso que involucró la cooperación de tres universidades, la Marina de los Estados Unidos e investigadores de todo el mundo, muestra cómo la terapia con fagos es un arma futura contra las infecciones bacterianas resistentes a múltiples fármacos que se espera que maten a 10 millones de personas por año para el 2050. La doctora Stefan Strady y su esposo, el doctor Thomas Patterson, son coautores de un libro sobre su historia llamado El Depredador Perfecto, la carrera de un científico para salvar a su esposo de una superbacteria mortal. Por sus esfuerzos por revitalizar la terapia con fagos en Occidente, fue nombrada una de las personas más influyentes en el cuidado de la salud por la revista Time en 2018. Tiene numerosísimas publicaciones en revistas de alto impacto y aún siendo tan joven, pudiésemos durar horas refiriendo todos sus logros. En esta ocasión, nos viene a platicar su experiencia de vida, que por fortuna y gracias a su inteligencia, experiencia, tenacidad y amor a su esposo, tuvo un desenlace feliz. La plática se titula... El enemigo de mi enemigo es mi amigo. Una perspectiva personal sobre resistencia bacteriana y terapia mediante bacteriófagos. Le pedimos al auditorio que si tienen preguntas las hagan a través del chat de YouTube o en los, en los comentarios de la publicación en Facebook. Al final de cada sesión se, se, se les brindará la respuesta. Doctora Stephanie Strady, por favor, adelante. Puede compartir su pantalla. Ya, bueno, ya lo van a compartir a través de su yard. Y... Iniciamos. Gracias, Dr. Vargas. And thank you for the invitation to present to all of you today. Um, lo siento, I am going to speak in English. Um, and I'm going to be talking about antimicrobial resistance from a personal perspective. Next slide, please. La próxima. A uh, few disclosures to make. My husband and I know, now own stock in a phage company. We never dreamed that we would have this uh, experience. Um, and all patient photos are shown with permission. And um, the land attribution, I, we are all on the Kumeyaay's unceded land. Next slide, please. La Proxima. This story began in 2015 when my husband and I were on vacation in Egypt. Um, my husband is also an AIDS researcher who has worked in Mexico along the frontera for uh, many years. Uh, he, many of you will know him. He is a psychologist. We travel together. We work together on the border. Um, he is about six foot five, but he weighs at the time about 300 pounds. Other than that, he looked healthy, but unfortunately, next slide, La Proxima, he um got very sick after we'd had a wonderful seafood meal on top of the cruise ship we were based at in Luxor. And he got very ill. He was vomiting all night. And the next day, um, he wasn't any better. So he was taken to a local clinic because there was no hospital in Luxor. 
Um, there, they had very limited resources, but they were um, able to diagnose him with pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of the pancreas. It turned out that a gallstone had lodged in his bile duct and caused a giant abscess to form the size of a small football. This abscess, or curazo, as we call them in uh, in Tijuana, among the populations I typically work with, which are injection drug users, this um, curazo um, was a place where inside it moved in a superbug, which is a bacteria that's resistant to all antibiotics. The doctors in Egypt saw that he was getting very sick. They helped us get him um, medevaced by air ambulance to Germany. Next slide, please, La Proxima. And you can see that here I am in full PPE with a mask and gloves and a gown, and Tom was in and out of consciousness. I thought that this was to protect him from other patients in the hospital, but instead it was Lotra, the other way around. It was that they were worried about getting an infection from Tom because the doctors did an endoscopy and saw that there was this brown putrid fluid in this abscess and inside it lurked the one of the worst bacteria on the planet. La Proxima. This is Acinetobacter baumannii, a superbug that I consider to be something of a bacterial kleptomaniac. It's an organism that I used to plate on my Petri dishes when I was a young student in the 1980s at the University of Toronto, where I studied. But back then, it was considered a very wimpy organism. Unfortunately, over the last several decades, it has gained superpowers by stealing antimicrobial resistance genes from other bacteria. Next slide, please. The doctors did what's called an antibiogram that those of you who are, who are physicians may be familiar with. It's an antibiotic susceptibility profile that helps doctors decide which antibiotics are best to treat him with. And you can see, even if you don't understand German, which I didn't, that all of these antibiotics in this chart that have an R beside them, it means that it was resistant to that antibiotic. And then it was only partially sensitive to three. And these were antibiotics that were very heavy duty antibiotics that are prone to side effects and have to be infused um, into the patient. Next slide, please. Now, here is when I realized that my husband is actually the poster child for this post-antibiotic era that we're on the verge of. It's estimated that by 2050, superbugs could kill 10 million people per year and that that will cost 100 trillion US dollars to the global economy through loss of productivity. La Proxima. And this is um, my husband after he was in the hospital a couple of months. Now we were medevaced back to San Diego where my colleagues at the University of California, San Diego were, were caring for him. Unfortunately, in the couple of weeks that it took to stabilize him in Germany and send him by air ambulance back to the US, his organism acquired even more resistance. There was not a single antibiotic left that would work. So he was considered too weak to operate on. Instead, the doctors put catheters in or tubes inside his abdomen to try to siphon off all of the infected fluid. And unfortunately, one of those drains slipped inside his body and it poured all of that infected fluid into his bloodstream, into his abdomen. He immediately went into septic shock. And from that moment on, he was dying a little bit each day. The Proxima. Now I had this conversation with Tom where I asked him if he wanted to live and to squeeze my hand and he squeezed it. And even though I was not a physician, I decided I would try to do something. And I went home and I started studying on the internet and I found a paper that was published in 2013 by some Spanish researchers on alternative treatments for, for Acinetobacter baumannii. And one of these was phage therapy. And this is um, short for bacteriophage. And bacteriophage are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. I remembered learning a little bit about them when I was a student at the University of Toronto, and I thought, wow, I never realized that these viruses had been used to treat bacterial infections. Next slide, please. 
It turns out that bacteriophage had been discovered over 100 years ago. As early as 1896, a researcher by the name of Ernest Hankin, who was a British researcher, he was in India and um, he had heard that the Ganges River had a folklore about it, that the river was supposed to be sacred and that the water could cure cholera. He was very interested in this and he took some of the water from the river and he put it through a Pasteur filter. And that kind of a filter screens out bacteria and he took the filtrate and added it to a Petri dish with cholera bacteria and it killed it. Now, he didn't know that he was actually looking at bacteriophage at the time. He said it must be a bacteriolytic agent of some sort. Now, researchers from Poland and other British researchers and, um, and Russia um, did similar experiments. And they also saw there was something that was killing the bacteria, but they didn't know what it was. It wasn't until 1917 that a French-Canadian self-taught microbiologist, Félix de Harel, who's pictured in the middle with the nice handlebar mustache, he repeated the same experiment, but this time using fecal matter from children that had survived dysentery. And that filtrate was able to kill the Shigella bacteria that were causing the dysentery in children that were still sick. And he deduced that whatever this was must be a parasite of bacteria because it was small enough to go through the Pasteur filter and still kill the bacteria. So he says, if it's a parasite of the bacteria, it must be a virus of the bacteria. And I am going to name it bacteriophage, which is derived from the Greek meaning bacteria eater. Well, Felix became quite famous in the 1920s and 30s he used bacteriophage therapy to successfully treat people with uh, dysentery. He went on to treat animals. He was the inspiration for the Pulitzer Prize winning book Aerosmith. And phage therapy had something of a heyday. He also helped set up what is uh, became the first phage therapy program, which is now called the Iliava Center, that was with his colleague from Tbilisi, Georgia, Georgi Ilyava. And that is when things got very interesting because now it was around the time World War II was starting and Stalin was embracing phage therapy in this center. And of course, Russia was an enemy of the West. And that whole idea uh, meant that phage therapy got the reputation of being Soviet medicine and the West like disdained Soviet anything. So as a result of that, phage therapy was abandoned by the West. But there was one more factor that played a role in um, phage therapy being abandoned in the West. Next slide, please. And that was the discovery of penicillin. Penicillin was actually discovered after phage in 1928. But it wasn't until World War II that it was brought to market because of the urgency of the bacterial infections on the battlefield. And with penicillin, the first antibiotic, it was thought, well, gee, phages are very finicky. They only attack, attack specific bacteria. With penicillin, its broad spectrum capabilities meant that it would kill all the bacteria, even if you didn't know what the problem was with the patient. That was thought to be a, a very good asset, but now we know that many antibiotics will kill the friendly bacteria in the microbiome as well. And that's not a good thing. Needless to say, phage therapy continued to be used in the former Soviet Union and in parts of Eastern Europe, but it was abandoned in the West in favor of big pharma that ushered in new antibiotics. But of course, now we're running out of antibiotics. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are not making them because multi-drug resistance is occurring and they're not lasting very long. So it's now our urgency that has drawn new attention to phage therapy. Next slide, please. So I had this idea, well, gee, you know, could we use phage therapy to cure Tom? Well, I needed to learn a bit more about phage therapy first. And so I'll tell you about what I learned as I did my research. Um, it wasn't until the 1940s, early 1940s, that phage were actually visualized for the first time and, and Felix de Harel was vindicated because when he came up with the idea that 
phage were viruses that attack bacteria. He had no proof. He could he could show that that whatever it was was killing the bacteria, but he didn't he couldn't prove that it was a virus because the micro the electron microscope didn't exist. Only the light microscope did. And so when the electron microscope was developed, they saw phage for the first time. So this is a modern day scanning electron micrograph. It, there's a bacterium stained in orange. It's magnified 100,000 times. It's being attacked by these phages. You see, they look a little bit like alien spiders. They are attaching through a receptor. Their genetic material drills into the uh, bacterial cell wall, takes over the bacterial cell wall, cell, bacterial cell, and turns it into a phage manufacturing plant. It's like a little like a zombie. It's not making bacteria anymore. It's making phage. If it's the lytic cycle of the phage, then the bacterial uh, cell is um, killed. It, it, lysis um, is the process through which the baby phage or virions burst out and go on to attack new bacteria, that, that, but only the bacteria that they're matched to. They don't touch the friendly bacteria in the microbiome. We know now that there's lots of different kinds of phage. I've, I've shown a couple pictures on the bottom of this slide and that there's an estimated 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. They're everywhere. About 30 billion phages move in and out of our bodies every day. We just didn't know that they were there because we didn't know how to measure them. There's phages in the ocean. There's phages in the water, uh, uh, the soil, everywhere. So it's uh, it, they're the oldest and most populous organism on the planet. Next slide, please. So where do you get phage from? Well, if you want to kill a certain kind of bacteria, first you try to find phage um, and you source it from the environment. A great place to find phage, believe it or not, is sewage. In fact, um, I often go to um, collect um, samples from the border region and from my duck ponds near and, and uh, swamps near my house these days. But here's a flask of sewage. I'm going to show you how to identify phage. Next slide, please. This is a Petri dish that is streaked with the bacteria we're trying to kill, Acinetobacter bomanii. Each one of those globs is a colony of bacteria. Next slide, please. You want to see if, if you can find some phage to kill that bacteria. You put a drop of sewage on the plate. You incubate it for 24 to 48 hours at a body temperature. And if it comes back looking like Swiss cheese, see those holes? Those are called plaques. That's um, even though it, you can't see the phage with the naked eye, you can see that they've been gobbling up those bacterial colonies. You get excited. You pluck out those plaques and you add more bacterial suspension. Those phage and the bacteria multiply. And even though you can't see it, it's like an invisible war that's going on between them. And you can grow up more phage this way. Then you need to purify it. And then it's ready to give to people or animals with infections. Next slide, please. So could we use phage therapy to cure Tom? Well, this was considered experimental treatment in the U.S. And in fact, in all of North America, it still is. But I really wanted to save my husband's life. So I asked my colleagues at the University of California, San Diego, if they would agree to help me do this. And the head of infectious diseases, Dr. Chip Schooley, said, if you can find phages that are a match for Tom's bacterial isolate, I'll call the FDA and see if they'll give us permission to treat him on a compassionate basis, which meant for a patient who's dying. Next slide, please. So I did uh, what anybody would do. I, I took this picture. This was actually a t-shirt that was given to me by our joint uh, uh, doctoral uh, uh, fellow at the time, um, Maria Luisa Mittal, um, who is known to many of you, I think. Because um, she grew up in Tijuana and has been working in the uh, in the border for a while, and it, the T-shirt says, "I survived Arachobacter." That's the nickname for Acinetobacter bomanii because so many veterans have come back from the Middle East with this infection. Next slide, and I took Tom's story and I wrote to total strangers, strangers who I knew from the internet were studying uh, phage and were studying. Um, bacterial infections. And a total stranger, Dr. Ryland Young from Texas A&M, wrote me back right away. And he said, I'll help you 
If you send me his bacterial isolate, I will turn my lab into a command center. And the pe people on the right hand of this slide put their lives on hold, their research on hold. The girl with the necklace is Adriana Carolina Hernandez. She slept in the laboratory for a couple weeks and found some phages that were a match for Tom's. It was really a wonderful thing. Next slide. So the next thing that happened is um, we were still trying to find more phage because we were worried that if there was, um, you know, too few phage or if they were all hitting the same receptor, that um, that it wouldn't that the bacteria could become resistant to the phage very quickly. So Dr. Jean Paul Pirnay from the Royal Astor Military Hospital was contacted by Dr. Young from Texas. And he said, we have some phage that are active against this organism. I can send them to you in a diplomatic pouch because he worked at the Royal Astor Military Hospital in Belgium. <coughs> and, next slide, please. Um, and that was the, the um, information that was needed to convince the U.S. Navy that they should help too. Because the FDA knew that the Navy and the Army were actually working on phage. They'd never used it on a human being before. But the Navy had sourced phage from the bilges of ships around the world. This is Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton, who looks a lot like Tom Cruise. He agreed to see if the phages that they had um, characterized would be a match for Tom's isolate. He put uh, the fellow on the right-hand side, Dr. Biswajit Biswas, to work. And they found four phages that were a match. So now we were really in business. Next slide, please. So Dr. Schooley, in the meantime, had a real dilemma on his hands because he had never done anything like this before. He used a living you know, virus to try to kill a bacteria. So he consulted experts around the world on what kind of dose to deliver, what routes of administration, how often and how long to treat the patient. And Dr. Maya Mirabishvili, who had been trained at the Iliava Center in um, what is now Tbilisi, who's now based in Brussels, she do uh, advised on the dosing. But she said, you know, we don't treat people intravenously because of the risk of, of, that the patient would go into septic shock. And so um, that was going to be something that was, was really worrisome. But Dr. Carl Merrill on the right-hand side, he used to work at the NIH on phage. And he said, this patient is fully colonized with this superbug. And if there's a hidden reservoir that the phage can't reach, the bacteria could become resistant very quickly. You must treat him intravenously. So we weren't sure if the phage therapy was going to cure him or kill him. Next slide, please. So we also had another problem. Um, the gram-negative bacteria, of which Acinetobacter baumannii is one, um, has a lipopolysaccharide layer, and that has a, it acts as a toxin. And so when the bacteria and the bacteriophage are, are fighting each other, the bacteria are dying, that lipopolysaccharide layer or endotoxin is in the preparation. That could actually harm the patient because of the toxin that is there. So you need to remove as much endotoxin as possible. Nobody knew what the safety threshold should be but we just wanted to reduce as much endotoxin as possible. So even though the Texas group had sent the, the uh, phage preparation to San Diego to be um, given to Tom, we had to put everything on hold because they found out that the endotoxin level was very high after they had already sent it. So we had to turn to colleagues at San Diego State University, our neighbors, who it turns out they were, they were not studying Acinetobacter, but they were studying phage in, in the oceans, and they had a um, endotoxin purification um, column that was set up to be able to help. So they worked all weekend too, and they were able to remove the endotoxin down to a level that we hoped was safe, but we weren't sure. Next slide, please. So this is the phage preparation as it was prepared by our investigational pharmacy at UC San Diego. It's got all of the numbers on it. We got emergency investigational new drug approval from the FDA to deliver this. And from my first email to the day that we started phage therapy was only three weeks. So compare that to an antibiotic that takes 10 to 15 years to develop and a price tag of a billion dollars or more. No comparison. Next slide, please. And this is what Tom looked like the day we started phage therapy.
He was on a ventilator. You can see he'd had a tracheostomy. He was on three different pressors to keep his heart pumping. And I signed the consent form for kidney dialysis the day we started phage therapy. He was not uh, roused at all. He was in a deep coma and he was thought to be within hours of dying. Next slide, please. This is Dr. Chip Schooley and Dr. Randy Taplitz. They're smiling for the camera because they knew they were making medical history, regardless of whether the patient lived or died. And um, it was a very scary moment. This was March 15th of 2016. He'd been in the hospital for four and a half months. Next slide, please. The first thing we did was we took the uh, Texas phages and we administered them into the catheters in his abdomen because that was the closest to the source of the infection. When he lived through that, the, the Navy phages were ready next. We administered those intravenously through his PICC line at 10 to the 9 PFU per mil. In other words, 1 billion viruses, 1 billion phages per dose every two hours. And it was the scariest day because we didn't know if he was going to have septic shock just from the phage therapy. Next slide, please. But three days later, Tom lifted his head, opened his eyes, um, and kissed his daughter's hand. Nobody knew that this kind of a miracle could happen. The director of the ICU said she'd never seen somebody so close to death that made a recovery like this. Next slide, please. Tom left the hospital in August of 2016, nine months after our ordeal began. He's wearing his Superman shirt. Next slide. And um, a couple of months later, he met Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton, who visited San Diego. Dr. Schooley published the paper in a top journal, but uh, this was only after some of the best medical journals had passed on it because they were biased by the taint of phage therapy being a Russian medicine, and um, they quickly changed their minds, however. Next slide. Because Tom's story actually, um, you know, turned out being a big deal. This is the first time a systemic superbug infection had been treated with, with phage therapy in the U.S. And this now is another electron micrograph. This is a, um, a micrograph that was prepared by the Department of Homeland Security. This is Tom's bacteria stained in blue being attacked by the Navy phages stained in green. Next slide, please. Now, at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of bacteriophage, one year after Tom was cured, the phage whisperer, Dr. Biswas, presented his case and he got a standing ovation. This was in Paris. And after that, the story was picked up by the media all over the world. I started to get contacted by people and their families and their, their patients who wanted phage therapy because someone they knew was dying. And, it, and since total strangers had stepped up to save my husband, I felt like I needed to help them too. So some of the same researchers and labs who'd worked on Tom's case also helped to try to save other lives. Next slide, please. We had enough success that our chancellor, um, Pradeep Kosla, at the University of California, San Diego, gave us seed funding to launch what became the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, or IPATH. Dr. Schooley and I co-direct this center. When we launched it, Science Magazine um, published a commentary saying that this is a game changer in the field. Next slide, please. We've gone on to treat many other patients at IPATH. We don't require that patients come to us. We, we have published protocols and worked with doctors all around the world. We get calls from Mexico, from Chile, from Australia, from Croatia, from Poland, from Turkey, from Malaysia, from the UK. And we've treated people with various underlying conditions and different kinds of superbugs. You can see that we don't always have successes it's often because the patient is so critically ill. We've also been trying to um, figure out ways that we can um, build a phage library. And I'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. I also wanted to show you how quickly phage can work um, in another way. This is the first experience that the Mayo Clinic had with phage therapy a couple of years ago. This is the case of John who shared his photos with me. 
he'd had a prosthetic joint in, 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 in infection um, and in his knee. And um, he uh, his sutures got ripped open and the superbug moved in. And it was very difficult to remove this infection because when you have any kind of device or hardware that's put in the body, it's prone to biofilms and antibiotics have a hard time penetrating them. He'd had 19 surgeries on his leg and the doctor said that he was going to have to have his leg amputated. That's what it looked like in the middle of this photo. You can see that his leg is very red um, and the infection was spreading and was likely to um, enter the bloodstream and, he, and then he might die. So um, he'd already picked out his wheelchair when his wife heard about Tom's case. And she um, contacted um, a phage company that had formed as a direct result of Tom's case. They agreed to source phage for John. And after two infusions, look at the picture on the right. He did so well that he was already out cutting the grass. Really re re remarkable. Now the Mayo Clinic has their own phage therapy clinic. Next slide, please. We've gone on to publish a number of case reports and case series based on the experiences that we've had. But what we really need now is to move phage into clinical trials if we're ever going to have it licensed alongside antibiotics. Next slide, please. Since we opened three years ago, we've had over 1,100 people contact us um, and their doctors. Um, however, phage is only recommended in just over 200 of these cases because, again, it's still considered experimental. If there's antibiotic options left, phage therapy is not going to be approved by the FDA. But in 170 of these cases, we initiated a phage hunt and we found lytic phages in 82 of these cases and we've treated 30 and there's 11 pending. Now that means we've only treated 2.6% of cases. And so we've obviously got some problems in the pipeline here. Sometimes patients die before we can source phage to treat them. Next slide. So we've got some challenges, but we have some opportunities. I talked to you about endotoxin removal. I talked to you about the dosing situation. The dosing still is challenging. We don't really know the best dose um, because the drug is alive. We know how much dose we're giving the patient, but as long as the bacteriophage are finding bacteria that they kill, they're going to keep multiplying. And so you don't really know how much the patient is really getting. So we need some pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies to figure that out. There's regulatory challenges, not just with the FDA, but in other countries because the drug is alive, right? Um, and we also have seen bacterial resistance to the phage. We saw this in Tom's case. We were able to source new um, phage that was a match for Tom's um, mutant bacteria. Um, but what we really need is a phage library. And there's also opportunities because sometimes there's synergy between phage and antibiotics. So that imagine the bacteria is being attacked by the phage by the antibiotic at the same time, and it has to make a genetic decision as to which one it would rather face. Sometimes it would rather face the antibiotic than the phage. And in Tom's case, for example, the bacteria dropped its capsule. That's a virulence factor, which is where the receptor for the phage is. So the phage wouldn't work anymore, but in dropping its capsule, it meant that the antibiotic could kill the bacteria. So it worked. So we need to be able to anticipate these kinds of synergies and use them to leverage um, the, the treatment. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, what we really need though is a phage library. Imagine a giant walk-in fridge that's full of phage that have been sourced from the environment, but they've been sequenced, they've been characterized, they've been annotated, and that we know um, which phage that they go best in a cocktail. Um, and we need to, to have different numbers of phage for different types of bacteria. For um, bacteria like staph and pseudomonas, it's thought that a fewer number of phage may be needed to match the majority of the circulating isolates around the world. But for the type of superbug Tom had, you have to match not just the genus and the species, you have to match the isolate. And for organisms like mycobacteria, it's even trickier, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. 
So um, Dr. Schooley and I have been very busy giving talks like this, but also advocating for the, the next steps in phage therapy research. We feel that we need to treat phage like living antibiotics and put it through the same level of clinical rigor that you would do if you were developing a new antibiotic. Next slide. And um, luckily, the NIH has funded its first phage therapy trial to the tune of $12 million through the Antimicrobial Resistance Leadership Group. Um, it was funded a couple of years ago, but because of the COVID pandemic, the design and the development was slowed down. We're about to start enrolling in 2022, and we'll be working with cystic fibrosis patients that have chronic pseudomonas infections. And Dr. Schooley is one of the principal investigators. So we're very excited about this opportunity. Next slide. And, and additionally, around the world, phage therapy trials have started to emerge. Um, people are seeing more um, potential for phage. And um, there's several that are underway, not just in the U.S., but across Europe. Next slide. And so the next steps are really to do translational studies clinical trials that would compare fixed um, cocktails that like staph and pseudomonas versus personalized ones like the kind that we used for Tom with acinetobacter. There's also the opportunity to genetically engineer phage to, um, to optimize the phage lifestyle, or even there's companies working on developing synthetic phage. We're working also with Canadian researchers to develop um, a phage program there as well. And we've been contacted by many patients in Mexico, and I would welcome the opportunity to partner with any of you. Next slide, please. I'll, before I close, I will uh, present one last case that is very exciting. The first genetically modified phage cocktail to be used to successfully treat a human infection occurred, and the case was published in 2019. This is the case of Isabel, a cystic fibrosis patient who'd had a double lung transplant and whose um, new lungs were being attacked by a deadly bacterium called Mycobacterium obsessus. This is a cousin to tuberculosis, which is a big problem, especially in the border region. Um, Isabel's uh, infection was fully systemic. She'd had an open um, chest wound. She'd had liver and lung involvement and skin nodules on her skin. Um, and um, it was, she was in hospice. Her, her case was so serious. Her mother heard about Tom's case, approached her doctor. The doctor reached across the U.S. Um, to um, us and to colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh who had a program called the C-Phages program. Any of you who are into microbiology might want to replicate this educational program that's, in, that's organized around students learning that same plaque assay that I showed you earlier and the students isolate phage. If it's a new phage, they get to name it, they sequence it, they annotate it, it goes into a phage library. Well, Dr. Graham Hatful, who directs this program, never dreamed that, that these phages could have a therapeutic potential. But when he was approached to try to see if any of his phages in this library were a match for Isabel, he said, sure, I'll check. He found one lytic phage, that was actually had been sourced from a rotting eggplant in South Africa by a student there. And its name was Muddy. Um, but he found only other, two other phage and they were not the kind that you want to use for phage therapy. They're called temperate phages. They do not kill the bacterial cell and the, um, the phage um, genetic material integrates into the bacterial's uh, genome and hits the snooze button, if you will. And so it, it's, um, it can also carry antimicrobial genes and toxin genes, so it's not ideal. And yet that's all they had. So they wanted to see if they could convert those temperate phage to lytic phage. And they did that through um, a predecessor to CRISPR-Cas gene editing called recombineering. And they clipped out the repressor gene, forcing this um, phage to become lytic. So now they had the first genetically modified phage cocktail. We were lucky that we were able to convince the UK government that because they were removing a gene and not adding a gene, it was not a GMO. And so the UK government agreed. Isabel was treated intravenously based on the protocol that Tom had. And she responded so well that she left the hospital within a week. Now she's had a very um, challenging course 
because cystic fibrosis patients are prone to recurring infections. But nevertheless, she's continued to receive phage therapy and she just celebrated her 20th birthday. It's a big success. Next slide, please. So um, the COVID pandemic has also brought new challenges. Um, and I wanted to make you aware that there's evidence now that the COVID pandemic is actually exacerbating antimicrobial resistance. A paper was published recently showing that there's been an increased incidence in central line associated bloodstream infections, catheter associated urinary tract infections, and ventilator associated events, and um, also sepsis. And also the, that resources that were dedicated towards antibiotic stewardship have been diverted to deal with the pandemic. So we've got, this is the next pandemic, antimicrobial resistance. It's already here and we all need to be aware of it. In fact, Mexico has had a number of challenges with superbug infections um, and um, it's a big problem um, in the border region. Next slide, please. So before I end, I wanted to also mention that there's other phage applications, such as the opportunity to replace antibiotics in livestock, agriculture, and aquaculture with phage. Phage has also been used to um, make food safer, for example, to decontaminate meat with, um, that was infected with listeria, or maybe even to treat salmonella that's infecting romaine and other uh, kinds of lettuces and produce. It's been used in apiaries to prevent foul brood, which causes beehive collapse. There's um, researchers working um, on phage as prophylaxis to prevent cholera during outbreaks. There's others that are hoping that phage could be used to groom the microbiome to weed out unfriendly bacteria so that maybe it will be used in probiotics someday. And then also, since we know through Tom's case, that it's okay to inject phage into somebody billions at a time without causing septic shock, that phage are now being seen as a potential vector to deliver cancer therapeutics and vaccines. So it's a very exciting um, new avenue for research. Next slide, please. So I want to um, end by acknowledging a number of our partners that we have had with IPATH um, around the world. Next slide. And of course, Tom and I were extremely privileged. We realized that we had resources that, that other people don't have. Could you put the next slide, La Proxima? And uh, we had a global village of people who stepped up to the plate to save my husband's life. And so I would challenge you by saying that miracles don't just happen. Miracles are made. The power of scientific collaboration is, is such that we can overcome even the most um, incredible challenges. And as a result of our story, my husband and I decided to write a book. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's called The Perfect Predator, A Scientist Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug. It has been translated into um, Japanese, Chinese, and Russian. I would love to see it translated into Spanish if anybody knows a publisher. Um, it's actually had quite um, uh, some good reviews. We have some interest from Hollywood, so it might end up being a movie. But the most important thing for us is that we spread the good news that sometimes the enemy of my enemy can be my friend. So with that, I will stop and see if you have any questions. And I'm sorry for the late start. We had some problems with the slides. Thank you very much, Dr. Vargas, for inviting me. Dr. Stephanie, for sharing your unpleasant experience but fortunately, it has a it had a very a very very happy ending. Yes. Um, yeah. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Stephen Estradi, por su conferencia. Ha sido muy ilustrativa respecto a cómo jamás jamás debemos darnos por vencidos ante la adversidad y de manera permanente estar leyendo y actualizándonos en el área de la salud para poder responder de la mejor manera a nuestros pacientes. Antes de continuar. Le recordamos al auditorio que accedan al formulario que aparecerá en el chat en vivo para registrar su asistencia. Eh, ahorita debe de aparecer en el chat ya el, 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 el vínculo. Yes, pues vamos There's a question from Guillermo who would like me to address what we can do to stop the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Would you like me to answer? Yes, please. 
So yeah, there's many things that can be done. And I'm glad you asked this question because um, it's thought that we need to have a multi-pronged approach. Um, the conceptual framework that is often used to describe that is called One Health. And it's the understanding that it's the intersection between humans, the environment, and animals that is playing a role in the spread of antimicrobial resistance and something can be done on each one of those levels. So in humans, um, we need to make sure that uh, physicians are only prescribing antibiotics when there is a bacterial infection. So that, you know, that means we need better diagnostics at point of care to help determine, A, is it a bacterial infection? B, is it, you know, what kind of antibiotic uh, susceptibility is there? And C, to, to be able to ensure that the right ones are getting um, administered to the patient. The patient then needs to ensure that they take the antibiotics as directed and not stop taking them too early and to not, to not try to self-medicate by going to like the pharmacy and buying antibiotics over the counter, as we know is, is the case in Mexico and many countries. But the most important is that 70% of antibiotics in the U.S. and in many countries are actually not used in humans. They're used in livestock and in um, agriculture to make animals grow fatter faster. And this is because of our reliance on meat. And so we as individuals can reduce our meat consumption, but we should also be talking to our government officials to put pressure on governments to stop using antibiotics in agriculture and on, on, on crops. Because if you use the same antibiotics um, in the environment that you're using as in medicine, that's going to breed the spread of resistance. So there's some legislation in the U.S. called the Pasteur Act that is hoping to get passed that will address some of these challenges. Every country has a national action plan um, at the urgings of the UN to be able to address antimicrobial resistance. So Mexico has one, the US has one, but we need to hold our policymakers to you know, their feet to the fire to ensure that they um, continue progress towards these goals because it's really a global health problem. So if, for example, the U.S. just focuses on its own myopic narrow view as it does and ignores what's going on in Mexico or in Canada, it's all going to blow back. I mean, the, the antimicrobial resistance gene called MCR1 that was identified the same month Tom got ill, November 2015, it was everybody thought that was a brand new thing. It was already in 30 countries because we don't have the global surveillance. So there's lots of things that we, we need to do as individuals and collectively. So thank you for that question, Guillermo. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Another question by the audience. In how many years would this be considered as a common treatment and resistant infections, or at least to be considered by medical insurances in the US? Hector Javier is asking. Yes, that's a very good question as well. Um, certainly, phage therapy can be given on a compassionate basis right now in the U.S. I'm not sure about what the regulatory pathway is in Mexico, but we um, we have been approached by many patients in Mexico. Um, and so there, it, as we've learned with the HIV epidemic, there is a possibility to be able to have a parallel track for using an experimental treatment for a compassionate basis while it's still being evaluated in clinical trials as a therapy that could be standardized. But we're a ways from doing that. The clinical trials need to get done. And once they're done, then the FDA and other regulatory agencies can review it and decide whether or not it's it could go um, standard of care. So in the former Soviet Union, in parts of Poland, it is standard of care now. I know the European Union is, is um, considering um, relaxing their guidelines to make it more um, uh, usable and, and more accessible to people. Uh, the FDA has not turned us down for a single request in the U.S. Um, so um, I, I hope that it will be within five years. Thank you, Stephanie. Another question? Jose Eduardo Gonzalez says, asking how accessible is phage therapy, speaking of economic cost? Well, right now, at least in the U.S., when you have an experimental treatment, it's not legal to charge for it. 
So the we um, our center, which is a nonprofit, by the way, based at UC San Diego, we do not charge for phage therapy. We do not charge for the consult. Some of the partner labs that we work with will ask for some money to help them identify the phage um, um, or to ship it. Um, but um, so one of our partners charges fifteen hundred US dollars for um, per per phage that's identified. So. Uh, if it's a three phage cocktail, then that's $4,500. So that's expensive for some people living in lower and middle income countries, but it's, that's not that expensive. If you consider the cost of a superbug infection in the hospital, I don't know how much it would cost if it's, if it's going to be made more widely available. There are definitely um, biotechs and pharmas that are working in this space. But right now, if any of you are physicians and you see that you have a patient with a multi-drug resistant bacterial infection um, that's not responding to antibiotics, you can email us at ipath at ucsd.edu for a free consult. What we ask is a brief medical history and the latest antibiogram, and we will tell you whether or not the patient would meet at least US criteria for phage therapy. And then we go on phage hunts. If you are um, connected to a research lab and you want to, um, um, get involved in phage hunts. We welcome any partner. And also we collect um, samples from the environment on a regular basis. Um, some specimens from hospitals or sewage um, or the Tijuana River are excellent places, unfortunately, to be able to source phage from. So if anybody wants to donate samples to our lab, we'd be thrilled. And we will even name a phage after you. <laughs> excellent. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Well, I think this is the, well, there's another question, please. <laughs> please, Stephanie, could you, could you answer yes. this question? Yeah. Is it possible that long-term use of fish can have some impact on the microbiota? So, yes, I mean, I mean what we need to do now is, um, is do more studies of the interaction between not just phage and bacteria, but um, the interaction with the human immune system, because that's the other missing ingredient. Less research has been done on this, but because we know that about 30 billion phages move in and out of our body every single day, it's not like we're um, phage therapy is introducing something foreign to the body. Um, so um, at this point, we haven't seen any side effects of phage therapy, even when it's injected. Um, yes, I could imagine that the microbial um, landscape is being altered somehow, and we would need to do studies before, during, and after phage therapy to see how that changes, and also um, in healthy people to see whether or not um, phage uh, is having an influence. But at least compared to antibiotics, the general feeling from the colleagues that I work with is that it has very minimal effect on the microbiome. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Excellent questions because there, it was an excellent presentation. We're going to end right now. And antes de finalizar, quisiera hacer entrega de la constancia por la excelente y extraordinaria presentación que nos hizo la doctora Stephanie Stradin, nuestra muy querida amiga. Eh, no sé si van a presentar la constancia, que dice así. Dice, la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, Facultad de Medicina y Psicología, otorga la presente constancia a la doctora Stephanie Stradin por su invaluable participación en la impartición de la conferencia The Enemy of My Enemy is My Friend, a personal perspective on antimicrobial resistance and bacteriophage therapy. Durante el segundo coloquio de investigación en salud de la Facultad de Medicina y Psicología, realizado del 22 al 26 de noviembre del 2021, dijo Juana Baja California, a 22 de noviembre del 2021, por la realización plena del hombre, firma nuestra muy querida directora, la doctora Julieta Yadira Islas Limón. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Stephanie. It was gracias, a and we hope we'll see you again. Please come okay. back. <laughs> we, need to, we need to see you more. Agradecemos su asistencia a este evento, a todos los que nos escuchan y nos ven. Y le recordamos a todos los participantes continuar, por favor, con su participación en las siguientes conferencias que podrán seguir mediante la transmisión en vivo por el canal de YouTube de nuestra facultad o por la página de Facebook Divulgación Científica de la Facultad de Medicina y Psicología.
que tengan muy buen día, que Dios los bendiga y estaremos en contacto próximamente. Gracias.